This presentation is called Jenkins State of the Union, the next 15 years. It's riffing a little bit on the 15th anniversary of Jenkins. What I'm gonna to try to do is to, first of all, look at how we got to where we are today, look at what went well over the last year, but also stand still and acknowledge that some things went less well as well over the past year. And then we're gonna look forward over the next two, three to five years. I, I don't really look much further into the future, I think, to really look at how DevOps will be in 2035 requires a crystal ball, or at a minimum, it'll be above my pay grade to make accurate predictions that far ahead. So, first of all, I just wanted to get a little bit of an idea of who's there in the audience. How many people use Jenkins as a user here? How many people administer a Jenkins server for a team? So, quite a lot. How many people have been using Jenkins for more than two years? More than five years? How many people have been using Jenkins since it was called Hudson? So slightly less, but still uh, quite a lot of diehard enthusiasts. Good to see that. So first, just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a new face here. This is my first DevOps world. Um, I started working as software developer in the late 90s in the dot-com boom. I moved into product management about 10 years ago, and I worked for a big company in the internet TV space, the multi-screen TV space. We used to like to say, if you want to set up your own Netflix and you want to compete with Netflix, then we can provide you all the software tools you need to do so. Around about five years ago, before Netflix had achieved global full-spectrum dominance, quite a lot of companies wanted to do this, so it was quite a successful business. And we faced the classic problems that a lot of companies faced around about then. We were releasing more and more complicated products that consisted of more and more disparate components that were based on different operating systems or databases even, and releasing went from taking weeks to you know, months to three months, and then after a super painful release, it would ship to customers, and they'd find a critical issue on the first day. And they'd ask that question that all developers love, do you guys test your software? And of course we did test our software, but not in the right ways and not automatically enough, and corners got cut at the end to release quickly. So we came to a realization, you know, something has to be done different. We were already making baby steps towards DevOps. We'd already started our path along CI, but we wanted to really move to continuous delivery. So after several workshops, we decided we're gonna do this. We're gonna automate all our pipelines. I asked the team, how long is this gonna take? And they all confidently looked at me and said, six to eight weeks. So I agreed, let's do this, and it took a little bit longer, but one and a half years later, we had something that was pretty good. And I mean, it did take a lot longer, but it was actually worth it, despite the massive efforts. I mean, we, were, we got to a point where every code commit led to unit tests being run, which led to component tests and functional tests being run, and then integration tests between the different components being run, and finally even automatic performance tests being run. And all this resulted in a continuous delivery package being ready. We didn't deploy it onto our customers' premises, but it, overall, management was happy, our customers were happy, the developers were happy, Far less often did we hear people ask, do you test your software? So overall, this was a really big win, and this really got me enthusiastic about DevOps. Um, so I decided to make it a full-time career, and I first worked at a company called CB Labs on an automatic deployment product, and now I'm here today for the last six months working on Jenkins. So I'm still pretty new to this, and I realize there's a lot of history, but. Uh, Still, I feel very privileged to be able to carry on the work you know, that's been done over the last 15 years and the great things that have been achieved. So another thing about me is that I really like pictures of clouds. And 
I've been really blessed over the last 10 years with the rise of cloud computing. Um, because you can always show pictures of clouds to convey whatever emotions you want. You can have you know, bright sunsets, or you can have dark storm clouds, or something ominous. But what I'm trying to say with this picture, actually, is that 15 years ago, clouds really only made rain. And when Jenkins was born, there wasn't really a concept of cloud computing. VMware was starting to come up, but you really talked about shared data centers, colos, these type of things. And the whole cloud didn't exist, but this is when the era that Jenkins was born. And since then, as we've seen in the keynote this morning and yesterday, we've had phenomenal growth. Um, we went through some of these numbers this morning, but I think it's worth noting that in July 2019, the last month we have numbers for, over 265 masters phoned home. And what that means is that there are actually much more masters out there because a lot of masters are behind firewalls or have the functionality to phone home switched off. Masters that phone home reports basic information to stats.jenkins.io. 30 million jobs were available in July 2019. But I think what's most impressive is that if you compare this to one year earlier, that's a 60% growth in the number of jobs. The number of masters phoning home has grown by 50%. And some of these masters might be temporary, ephemeral masters that are spawned very quickly and die more quickly. But I think the number of jobs really, and the increase in that really shows the growth in this. Most companies in Silicon Valley or elsewhere would kill to have 50, 60% growth for a product that's five years old, let alone 15 years old. So I think at this level of maturity, it's something to be really proud of. This doesn't mean to say, though, that Jenkins is done. One of the most annoying things as a product manager is sometimes the chief financial officer comes to you and says, so is the product done yet? Can we stop investing? Is it just ready, you know? Can we put it into maintenance mode? And I think the answer of that is no. Jenkins is far, far from being done. Um, we're adding a lot of great functionality to this. One of the big features that has been worked on for some time that's really coming into maturity this year is configuration as code. Mark Waite will be giving a talk about configuration as code. I think it's tomorrow at 2.45. Um, he'll go into a lot more detail if you want to learn more of the details about this, but very briefly, configuration as code allows you to export all the configuration of a Jenkins master. You can export this into a YAML file, and then you can use this to either back up the configuration of your instance, you can use it to create new instances, to effectively clone it, make small changes. Huge efforts been underway in the last three months to productize this, to improve the documentation, fix defects, fix security holes. Uh, CloudBees um, is just about ready to announce tier two support, which is their second highest level of support for this plugin. So if you're a CloudBees customer, it's also now supported. Um, Another big step is the move from Java 8 to Java 11. This is more than just changing the JDK. Because of the introduction of modules in Java 9, quite a lot of deep surgery was required inside of Jenkins. Um, and one of the reasons why this was particularly important was that for quite a long time, projects that required deep surgery, deep refactoring inside Jenkins have either not happened or been delayed or just not seen through to the end. But I think this project was seen through successfully. It was released a few months ago. Um, it's a big win for the continued support of Jenkins. Java 8 is by no means dead. There isn't even an end of life in sight for supporting Java 8. Um, one Java 14 or whichever version of Java gets dubbed as the next LTS. We'll pick this up and add support for this. Jenkins security is another key area of investment. Um, we have a mature security team. We have five full-time engineers. One of them's in this room. Vadek, stick your hand up. He's over there at the back. 
If you're interested in learning more about Jenkins security, Vadek is giving a talk today at 4.15, was it? 4.15, so go check that out if you're interested in that. Um, the team's been working on hardening Jenkins, mm -hmm. fixing security vulnerabilities, um, fixing issues as they come in. Um, it's often difficult to tell nice stories about security fixes because they're either low level or somewhat secret. But I think telemetry is a nice instance that I can talk about. So one of the internals of Jenkins is a component called Stapler. And what Stapler allows you to do is it essentially provides a REST API that allows Jenkins, the Jenkins object model to be exposed through HTTP calls. And at some point during the last year, we found that it was possible to abuse this and to get sensitive information out of Jenkins. So the initial idea was we should whitelist some of the calls, blacklist other calls. But because Jenkins has 1,666 plugins, as Kosi K said, or probably slightly more now, it's impossible to know exactly what all these plugins are doing. So the danger was that if we just blacklisted certain functionality, we'd either keep security holes open or we'd break functionality that existed. So a decision was made to work extended telemetry that's used by stats.jenkins.io to send back more information about which calls were being made to Stapler and then based on this improve the whitelisting and blacklisting. And the beauty of this was after a few months of gathering data, we actually found that there was a much easier solution to the problem at hand. We didn't need to simply whitelist or blacklist in a very coarse or fine-grained manner. There was a much more elegant solution that was cheaper to develop and also performed better. So this was one of the key wins of the security team, which I'm sure Webex would be happy to tell you more about. In terms of community, we've been making a big effort to build and engage with the community. So one important thing is obviously having a focus on community PRs, reviewing these in a timely manner, providing good feedback, and then as soon as is possible, merging the code in. Another important thing is we've been working a lot with interns. For instance, Google Summer of Code is one intern program, and we've worked with other intern programs from Outreachy. Tomorrow, around about lunchtime, one of our interns, Natasha Stopa, will be giving a short presentation, and Martin Danju over here has also uh, been quite responsible for helping mentor interns. Um, another major development is Jenkins joining the Continuous Delivery Foundation. I'm going to be speaking more about this in a few slides' time. So this is all really good, positive, strong growth, new features, but I think it's necessary also to be cognizant or to stand still with the fact that not everything is perfect about Jenkins. I'm sure most of you already know this. I mean, the, there are many areas of Jenkins that are in need of maintenance, um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about this, but I think first it's also necessary to stand still and mentioned that not every project that was started in Jenkins OSS or by CloudBees has gone to plan. Not every project has seen its way through to fruition to being released. Some projects got de-scoped, some projects got stopped or never really got the critical mass necessary to be seen through. Five superpowers is one, or that only one of the five superpowers that was talked about in the previous year that came to fruition was configuration as code. Jolton, Jenkins, Evergreen, Blue Ocean even got de-scoped. Um, though I think everybody had the best of intentions here, I think it is just necessary to stand still and just realize that for people that work hard on these projects, it can often be painful to see that the work, the time they invested, didn't make it into the main line, or the feature that they worked on didn't come to be as big or great as they had hoped. And this can be painful, but it's also part of the, you know, the product development process. I mean, a lot of code just gets thrown away or isn't as important as you think it is initially, but still I'd like to thank all the people that have worked on this. Speaking of Blue Ocean, 
A couple of years ago, Blue Ocean was positioned as being the replacement for the Jenkins UX. The initial work that was done on Blue Ocean was focused, first of all, on visualizing pipelines, and then the idea was that it would spread out and replace the Jenkins UX. Um, it did a really great job of visualizing the pipelines, and this is a popular feature for a lot of people to see the progress of their pipelines, but when it came to spreading out and replacing the rest of the Jenkins UX, we ran into some issues. Extensibility hadn't been addressed in initial design, and extensibility is key when you want to bring on board the 1600 or so plugins. Many of these plugins contribute visual components, and we ran into some walls then. And at a certain point during the last year, we made a decision to retrench to focus Blue Ocean on pipelines where it was already doing good work and was almost complete. Major developments have stopped on Blue Ocean. We're still fixing issues. We released a couple of issues in the past month that have been fixed. Security issues will obviously still be resolved. Community PRs that add value will be merged as much as possible. And we do have plans to move forward, which I'll talk about slightly later. So, as I mentioned, there are some major areas of Jenkins that are in need of love. Um, in my opinion, the first and foremost is the UX. The pipeline visualization looks good. The rest of the UX, in my opinion, looks outdated. It just doesn't look like a product does in 2019. Definitely doesn't look like a product should look in 2025. There are a lot of core libraries and frameworks that are outdated. There's also, in plugins need a lot of love and development. So how are we going to find a path forward? How are we going to move the product into the next decade of development? I think there's three pillars that I think that this development can be based upon and that we're working on. First of all, it's really important to note that despite all of the cool new products, such as you all saw SDM this morning, hopefully software delivery management, <laughs> which is CloudBee's new products, you've probably all heard of Jenkins X. But despite all this, the enterprise runs on Jenkins. The enterprise will still be running on Jenkins for many years to come. And for this reason, CloudBee still fully supports Jenkins. We have three teams of full-time developers that are working full-time, 100% on Jenkins. We have the foundation team, which work on pretty much everything except for security and the core pipelines. We have the security team, which I mentioned. We have a pipeline team, which works both on the visualization, but also on the core mechanics, the declarative language, all that stuff. We're in the process of building up a new UX team. If anybody feels up to the challenge of building a new UX and is looking for a new job, please come and speak to me. Besides CloudBees, the open source community is the other great pillar, and we're working hard to build a stronger community. Yesterday, if you saw the keynote, you saw Tracy Miranda as our director of open source. She's working hard with a team of people to build the community, and that's one hand is things like community building, so organizing conferences, meetups, you know, outreach programs, Google Summer of Code, the like. The other hand, we've got a couple of engineers. One popular open source engineer, Oleg Neneshev, is going to be working more and more on the technical side of this, so making technical improvements that make it easier for open source contributors to contribute code, the automatic generation of release notes, for example, help with you know onboarding people, making new builds, just making the whole open source contributor experience you know nicer and more rewarding. The final thing is Jenkins is never been a possession of CloudBees. Jenkins has always been its own part of its own open source foundation, the Jenkins Foundation. But recently the Jenkins' ownership has moved to the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Tracy talked about this a lot yesterday, but if you weren't there, just to give a short summary, the Continuous Delivery Foundation is a neutral home for the next generation of continuous delivery collaboration. 
It was formed in March of this year. It includes Jenkins, of course, but it also includes Jenkins X, Spinnaker, and Tekton. Its members are many companies in the business, such as GitLab, Circle CI, CloudBees, of course, Google, Netflix. But it also has member companies that are not software manufacturers. Well, they, they make software, but they make it for running their businesses, for running their banks, for instance, or for running their hospitals or other things. So we have, for instance, HSBC or Capital One as members. And the goal of the Continuous Delivery Foundation is to ensure interoperability, to make sure these products work together, that you know they stay alive, they have a good future. And the more talks about the Continuous Delivery Foundation here, I don't have the list of them, or you can go check out the Continuous Delivery Foundation next to the CloudBees booth. So I think with these three pillars together, CloudBees continues support for Jenkins, the open source community, the Continuous Delivery Foundation, I think we can build great things together and we can keep Jenkins you know, moving forward into the next decade so that it remains the number one DevOps tool, bar none. So where do, you, do I think or do we think we should make an investment in the future? Personally, or after speaking to many people, the consensus seems to be that there are three areas that really need focus. The first one is the Jenkins UX. The second one is refreshing and updating core libraries to get Jenkins onto a modern basis. And the final area is plugins manageability. And we will probably add more to this, but for the next couple of years, these will be some of the areas of major investment. When it comes to the UX overhaul, um, I think almost everybody agrees that Jenkins UX is dated. We tried with Blue Ocean to replace this, and this didn't go as planned. We, we need to learn the lessons from Blue Ocean. We need to create a new UX framework that's designed with extensibility up front so that we can bring along almost all of the plugins or as many plugins as are still maintained. I think in terms of the UX, what you see here is a mock-up, and it's by no means the final UX, but I think it does convey the idea what we want. I don't want something that is overly designed, that's too fancy, that has lots of gimmicks. We need a simple, clean UX, has accessibility, that's fast, and that's easy to extend. We need to work on library refreshing. We're on an outdated version of Spring. We need to get, for instance, the latest version of the Spring framework. We need to move towards a modern web framework. So this is one of the key enablers for the new UX. Several other ideas are under consideration, so more to be filled out here in future talks. Plugin manageability is an issue, I think. Most people agree that, and it's also, there's a lot of different schemes both in the open source and in CloudBees for managing plugins. It's not easy to understand. There's a lot of problems with plugin isolation. There's also a lot of problems with complicated nested dependencies in plugins where you often need a lot of different plugins just to do something straightforward. If you're a developer and you want to build a CI system for Spring Boot, for instance, it's really not clear, if, unless you're a Jenkins expert, which plugins you need. So I'm touching on a lot of different areas where I think plugins can be improved, where we can make the manageability better, where we can make the whole experience of using Jenkins better. Because plugins is really Jenkins' power, but it's also its Achilles' heel at time. So finally, I'd like to close out just with another picture of clouds. And I think if we work hard, you know, we keep moving forward in the right direction, I think Jenkins is going to have a really happy future in the next 10 years. If we're complacent, however, and we just stand still and think, you know, we're number one now, we're the biggest products here at DevOps World, then gradually, by gradually, you know, other products will replace us, you know, and that's what happens to all products that get complacent, that you know, think that they're number one. So I think it's 
really important that we keep moving this product forward day by day, week by week, month by month, and keep on improving it so we can keep on bringing on board new users. So those were my closing thoughts, but finally, I'd be remiss to not mention I'm an employee of CloudBees, and CloudBees have a number of products. Some of them are directly inside the Jenkins arena. So for instance, we have the CloudBees Jenkins distribution. The CloudBees Jenkins distribution, as the name says, is CloudBees' own distribution of Jenkins. And what this does is it brings you Jenkins, it's free, but it includes a number of premium plugins that help with the management of the plugins. So it has a plugin called Beekeeper, which gives you access to the CloudBees Assurance Program. It has a plugin called Advisor, which gives you feedback about your Jenkins instance, tells you whether you're running it according to best practices or not. CloudBees also sells support for Jenkins. We have the best support for Jenkins of any company. We have the most Jenkins engineers, the most contributors. You can buy support from Jenkins for $3,000 for up to 10 users. We also have a lot of other products, too many to mention, but there's plenty of talks about them here today. So now I'd like to open the field to questions, if anybody has questions. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So the thinking is that eventually the UX for pipelines will be replaced, but the, the Blue Ocean for pipelines has a pretty good UX at the moment, so it's not the area of top priority. So, so the idea really is that first of all, we really want to spend a lot of time on the architecture instead of just starting to build something and then trying to, you know, like an oil kind of smudge, kind of like cover the whole UX. We want to really build first with extensibility and solve that problem and then address the issues that, or the parts of Jenkins that need it most first, and then eventually, probably in several years' time, we'll replace pipeline so that we have one consistent UX, but it's the lowest priority out of the whole UX. Um, I think, no, I mean, I think the general configuration, the reporting, that kind of stuff is the high priority, seeing, being able to debug issues, so getting better feedback, you know, when your builds break, that kind of stuff. These are the areas of highest priority, I think. It's uh, a lot of work still needs to be done there, though. We're just building the team up as we speak. Go ahead, the man in green shirt. Yeah, sure. So Blue Ocean will be maintained. We're not going to actively build new functionality, but we are still closing bugs. I mean, we closed two issues last month. We're working on closing an issue now. So if you have issues that are blocking you from working, please submit them or make noise about them if they've already been submitted, and we are working on those. And if you submit PRs for Blue Ocean, we will merge them as much as possible. We're just not going to build major new features in it because uh, we've decided to move in a different direction. Any other questions? Martin? Well, I, th I think it's important to note that, I mean, the CloudBees distribution of Jenkins is essentially just Jenkins plus free plugins, to put it very bluntly. So it's not a, it's, it's not like we forked Jenkins. And so, I mean, we do have a product called Core that's maintained by CloudBees, but uh, it, it will definitely be in the community version of Jenkins. Yes, 100%. Yes. So 
So at the moment, um, from the CloudBees side, we have something called the CloudBees Assurance Program. And inside the CloudBees Assurance Program, we we basically say these the versions of these plugins, or we specify a version of plugin and say, we've tested that this works with Jenkins. And if there's issues in these plugins, then we are take a responsibility or liability to fix these. So gradually, we're working to bring more plugins into the CloudBees Assurance Program. But it is a slow process because of that support liability. So we have paying customers that pay us, and then we say that these plugins will work. So, so we have quite a high bar for taking community plugins in. But we are looking at community plugins that improved. So there's a plugin that changes the CSS, for instance. That's one plugin that we're looking at and seeing whether we can either take that on board or take the good bits and add that into the course. So we're definitely looking. And um, if you've got some ones that you think we should look at, then come and speak to me or lodge a ticket. The gentleman over there? Yeah. Um, it's an open source, well, it's going to be an open source delivery, but I think it will be largely driven from inside of CloudBees, and I think that's mainly because of the nature of uh, UX requires a high degree of coordination. I think, you know, when everybody, if everybody without a lot of coordination is working on UX, it's quite difficult. Whereas if people want to work on specific areas of it, though, we would obviously, in particular subdomains, we would welcome help there. We're definitely very interested to get the inputs from the outside world, and we've been speaking to people, obviously not to everybody, about this. Um, I think ultimately, at some point, though, I mean, the designing UX by committee is is never particularly successful. At some point, you know, you need to have the kind of benevolent dictator approach where one designer or one team does the majority of the work. But I mean, we're always open to input and suggestions and. Obviously, if there's a particular subdomain that's not being loved enough and you or somebody else feels drawn to work on that, then that's very welcome. It's just, but it's, I think it's very difficult to come up with a cohesive, you know, easy to understand, consistent UX when you've got 120 different people or submitting PRs without a high degree of coordination between them. So it's a, it's a challenge. And yeah. Yeah, that's always possible. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? The man at the back, Joe. Any other questions? Yes. So configurations code is available. I mean, we've released 1.2.7 of it recently. But within the context of CloudBees support, it's, I think, next week, basically. We're, we're literally doing the last PRs around getting the documentation in place and the uh, and from then it will be supported. So we still, it's worth noting, there's, there's a whole session about configuration as code. I think it's tomorrow. Let me just check exactly when it is. But there's, there's a whole session about configuration as code that will go into more detail. And that will tell you some of the limitations of it. So there's certain plugins in configuration. So. Exporting and importing is done plugin by plugin, so we don't support every plugin, which is one limitation. But uh, we are going to be offering full support soon. So the session is on. 
It's called Docker and Jenkins' as Code. It's at 2.45 tomorrow, if anybody's interested. And we have a whole 45 minutes about this, including a demo. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you t t clarify the problem? Yeah. Yeah. big plans in that area. We, ha we have a separate product manager that manages pipelines. That's not my exact area of expertise. I'm more on the UX and the general side of things, but I'm not aware of anything to improve that in the, let's say, the one to six month future. There may be plans later, but but I mean, if you, if you want to talk about your use case, I can put you in touch with the product manager that's responsible for that. And you're talking from the UX side of things, or you're talking just from the Groovy declarative pipeline? From the Groovy side of things, yeah. So, I mean, that's still being actively developed, so you can come and talk to me. I can get you hooked up with the right person for that. Any other questions? Yes. Um, they will continue to be supported until they're replaced by something else. So maybe we'll keep them alive for longer. I'm, I'm not. I mean, we haven't hashed out all the architecture yet. But I mean, the idea of the new UX is that it will be based on HTTP. It'll be, it'll be a modern UX, so it'll be a HTTP layer, and you know, there'll be a React or Vue or Angular front end that calls these. So. There should be a lot more APIs available for you know easily retrieving data from Jenkins, and so you could build your own tools on top of that if you should want to. Any other questions? Going once, twice, three times. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>